Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar brought to you by Bruce Sam Malaysia and managed by our company LifeChamp. So today's our webinar title is Automotive Technologies at a Profound Inflection Point. So welcome to this web, uh, webinar, guys. So uh, this is Shen Chu. I'll be the moderator for this session. Now, as you know, uh, technology has grown by leaps and bounds. So cars, automobiles were used to be very mechanical and now cars are very electronic based. So today we're going to look into uh, how automotive technologies has evolved and why is it at a profound inflection point and where are the investment opportunity in the supply chain. All right. So as usual, disclaimer, so whatever you share on this webinar is only for educational purpose. So in no way that I give you any recommendation to buy or sell any securities mentioned here. So if you decide to make any investment decision, you're 100% responsible for all your investment risks. So allow me to briefly introduce our speaker. So uh, today's uh, our speaker is none other then David Poe, who is the founder and managing director of Spiral Thinker Group, Sindram Bahad. Now, David graduated with a Bachelor of Engineering Electronics majoring in uh, telecommunications from Multimedia University, Cyberjaya, and has seen built his career in the tel telco industry for 10 years before turning to his passion in value investing. So he also served as the executive director in a local equities education and research firm for three years, managing research effort and delivery advanced value investing and portfolio management education series. So thereafter, he set up to uh, pursue his own aspiration by establishing Spiral Thinker Group to pursue quality market research, reporting to high net worth clients to, and to deliver inte uh, intelligent value investing education programs. So David is also a full-time investor and he provides value investing ideas and advanced portfolio strategies for high net worth individuals. So he's often invited to speak at Busa and broker seminars, webinars, and workshop. And his professional comments and opinions on value investing are often featured in business publications like Focus Malaysia. So welcome to this uh, webinar, David. So glad to have you here. Hi, <coughs> hi, hi. Good evening, Shane. Wow, that is a very mouth mouthful uh, introduction, huh? Next yeah. time, just uh, introduce me as a full-time investor. Lah. I think that is good enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, David. More time for the presentation. Okay, let so me... Hand the session on. over to you. Huh? Yeah, okay. Can, can. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see you guys here again. Uh, I think some of you were surprised not to see me in a, uh, in a webinar a couple of weeks ago. But uh, this is just uh, part of our succession plan in our company to introduce more uh, speakers to the market. Uh, but don't worry, we, uh, all our speakers are very <coughs> quality uh, speakers as well. Now, tonight's um, topic is again, back to one of the more popular ones um, related to automotive electronics as well as semiconductor. Now, um, you, may be, you may be a bit uh, surprised, wow, this title is so long, right? So chung hey, yeah? uh, but, uh, we actually uh, gave a lot of thoughts into the title because we want the title to capture the essence of what we would like to present tonight. Now you can, you actually one of the things, or uh, one of the <clears throat> um, different, the difference that you can see is we don't use automotive electronics in this session, but we use automotive technologies because we do not want to limit the, 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 this uh, perspective of our session tonight to just the electronics or semiconductor. In fact, we want to be we want to try to expand our our uh, uh, view to a broad a broader range to include the other technologies as well. And of course, why did we choose the word profound infection point? Uh, that will be the objective tonight. Uh, my job tonight is to show you what is happening around the automotive technologies so that you can see that this is we are truly going through an inflection point uh, to the next uh, growth phase, okay? So as usual, uh, normally I, I split my uh, session to a few subtopics. All right, we're gonna start off by re-looking at the paradigm shift in automotive techno technologies. Uh, I'm gonna recap a couple of the things that I've talked about last year and two years ago. Um, then we move on to the electrification as well as automation demands as a result of this um, shift in automotive technologies, then um, I think it is, uh, uh, of course, we cannot talk about all the technologies under this topic, under this very big topic. So we're gonna focus on battery technologies a little bit more tonight. 
Then I'm going to move on to case studies. All right. So hopefully, um, this is going to be a very long topic. Uh, hopefully, I can finish. I promise Shane that I'll try to do it. Um, I'll try to end it by 9.45 so that we have a bit more time for Q&A. All right. So uh, please excuse me uh, if my <clears throat> I'm not too um, clear my voice tonight. Please let me know in the chat if you, you can't hear me properly. Yeah. Okay. Now let's move on to the first topic, which is hey, what happened? Okay, paradigm shift in automotive technologies. All right, just a recap of uh, one of the topics from last year uh, where we talk about Industry 4.0. Uh, all right, uh, but we were focusing still on ele industry electronics, right? But I would like to bring your attention back to the definition of Industry 4.0. In fact, the electrification of vehicles is also part of the uh, evolution of Industry 4.0. Now, in the layman's term, what is the what is the industry 4.0? Now, industry 4.0 is basically just reinventing or redesigning what we have and what we are using today by combining electronics or computing uh, power into our system, our machines, and connecting to the internet cloud. All right, that's I mean, if you if I were to drill down to very basic, simple terms, that's the de definition of industry 4.0. Case in point, you take a phone from the 80s, you know, where you know where we have this um uh not so colorful phones like the feature phone, we call it uh, all right for Nokia, Motorola, all right, then and then we 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 built, I mean we include a more powerful computer computing chips into this device. Then we have a smartphone today, which is you know, uh, so more so much more powerful and so much more features because of the extra computing power. Likewise, all right, other than <clears throat> this, something not right with my mouse, uh, excuse me, yeah. With a, with, a, with a simple watch, you know, a, even a digital watch, we put more computing, we put a computing chip inside, they become a smart watch, smart watch as we know today, all right. Then same with the speakers. Now we have Alexa, we have all these ten, uh, uh, Jingling Ten Mao from a lot, and a lot of other brands from China, right? So the same is happening in the very traditional automotive uh, sector as well. Um, even uh, since the days of Henry Ford or, or, or these uh, bands, then we have a, a, a car in the 80s. And then when we put, when the cars are more and more electrified, right? We put in more computing power, right? That is where we are, we are heading to, towards the electrification as well as computerization of the vehicles. Then of course, we do not uh, go from step one to, to the future of cars in, in one go. There are a lot of phases that we have to go through. That's why, of course, the ultimate aim is to have a fully battery powered electric vehicle. But in the milestones would be you know, hybrid, uh, hybrid cars, plug in hybrids, not only to the fully battery, uh, auto, battery uh, uh, powered electric vehicle. Okay, now um, let's look at uh, some of the trends that has been surrounding the automotive uh, space in the past few years. I'm not sure if you remember in the late 90s and towards the two, uh, uh, 2000s, in that decade, right? Um, I think the, I still remember my very first car. It was a Toyota LE 1985 model. The only electric thing in my car that my eye can see is, is the radio cassette player, right? I, I, I still remember a lot of my friends, they're all hobbies, right? They like to spend a lot of money to, to have the to to to, to um to have the most jungle or latest state-of-the-art uh, cassette player. Then it moved on to CD player, right? Then later on we have more uh, um electronic uh, devices like the GPS, then uh, some of the cars are even have Bluetooth connectivity then. So that was what was happening throughout the uh, most part of 2000. Then in, in, uh, in the next decade in 2010, right? Surprisingly, the trend is actually having bigger and bigger cars. Um, the electronics um, features, I'm not talking about the KC or the uh, uh, you know, parts that we cannot see them. I'm talking about mostly dashboard, right? Um, actually, there's not much uh, development there, but cars are getting bigger. I don't know whether it's because of cheaper oil price or that consumers uh, then are more have, have more purchasing power and they would like to enjoy uh, a, a better ride, right? So the cars, SUVs were the thing then. Uh, 
Then in 2020, the focus shift towards more environmental friendly um, agenda, uh, especially with the things related to climate change, you know. And that is why we are going through, we are seeing what we have today, where a lot of technologies in the automotive space is being focused on electrifying the uh, passenger car, whether it is more uh, less reliance on oil, uh, 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 better uh, systems that uh, has less waste stages, so on and so forth. Okay, then of course the future is where, where we have uh, um, the, the, there will be more focus on driving comfort uh, as well as onboard experience, that is for sure. And then, um, then later on, uh, in towards the distant, uh, more distant futures, we would have more what we call V2X technology, vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to anything technology. Uh, eventually, uh, that is heading towards the autonomous driving uh, uh, regime. Uh, then, of course, the uh, in the future, I do believe that the ownership model of uh, passenger cars is going to change drastically uh, more to something like, uh, you know, a mobility as a service or a subscription kind of thing. Uh, I do believe that it's going to happen, uh, but maybe not in the next couple of years. Now. Okay, there's something to look forward to. Now, now why is this happening? Now, over at Spiral Thinker, right, we believe EV is not a something that that uh, was created on its own, but more so it is an extension of a bigger theme, uh, which is related to ESG. Now, you know that since two years ago, towards the end of two years ago, we started talking a lot about ESG, and we believe that this is uh, in definitely one of the most um, uh, critical investment themes or, or economic or whatever themes that you have to look at in the next, in the, in the future, right? So now previously, what's happening is a lot of the risks which is being defined by the authorities, right? Well, a lot, uh, a lot of them are focusing on economic risks. But over the years, especially in the past, uh, in the late, in the more recent years, uh, two, three, or four years ago, right? A lot of the, the focus has been shifting from economic, from geopolitical towards environmental. As you can see here, this is the uh, latest uh, WEF, or World Economic Forum, uh, global Risk Perception Survey, uh, all right. It, it can, as you can see from the ranking of this of, of this survey, uh, most of the participants rank climate action failure, extreme weather, biodiversity as the top three risks. Now, green refer uh, uh, is actually referring to environmental risks, uh, uh, as well as other than that, as well as human envir environmental environmental damage, natural disaster, uh, natural resource crisis. Now, why is this so? If you look on the right-hand side, right, these uh, environmental related risks has, most, has a profound effect on a lot of other sectors, a lot of, of other uh, segments of our life, livelihood uh, compared to the other kinds of risks. That is why a lot of attention, uh, a lot of um, policies, a lot of uh, uh, investments are actually being poured towards this direction. Because if we fail, to take drastic action on how we treat the environment as well as the climate uh, in this lifetime, right? I, we, I think it, is, it doesn't take a scientist to, to, to foresee that uh, it's going to be, have a very uh, huge and uh, negative impact on, on the future uh, generation, okay? Now, that is why, uh, and then, what, then, then you, may, you may be asking, so what does this E has to do with EV, right? Now, if I'm not sure if you still remember this uh, slide from uh, my earlier webinar in 2021, um, one of the reasons why we have so much, um, why we are experiencing more and more natural disasters uh, like floods, you know, a high rising temperature uh, recent years is because of this phenomenon called GHG, or it is, it is actually referring to greenhouse gas effect. Now this greenhouse gas is, effect is actually it's not just carbon dioxide, it's actually a combination of a few gases, uh, which is emitted, uh, uh, most of it from industrial uh, or human activities, right? Um, it causes, it is causing a lot of negative impact on the environment, specifically on the pollution as well as the uh, global uh, temperature. And the main culprit of this GHG emission, right, the, the main source, right, um, is actually from uh, emissions from petroleum fuels as well as refined products. Now, a lot of us may, may think that 
most of the pollution or most of the impact uh, sources will come from you know the production or the mining or the processing of, of these petroleum fuels as well as uh, refined products, right? But based on this um, very simple visualization from IHS market uh, back in 2020, it shows a very stark um, truth where from the well to the tank, uh, actually the GHG share, the share of the GHG emission is at most up to 30%. Now, bulk of the GHG is actually being emitted uh, from uh, the transportation uh, system uh, through the combustion uh, system, all right? Uh, as well as, you know, not just, not, not, not just from transport, uh, actually from a lot of uh, manufacturing activities or, or other human activities as well. So this shows us that we have to nip the problem in the bud. Uh, by tackling uh, the, the, the main source of GHG emission. And in this, uh, uh, what I'm trying to point here is actually in the vehicle. And, you know, in the vehicle technology, whatever that we are driving on road today, right, structurally or architecturally, they are not so much different from the cars uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Yes, it's more advanced, we have more electronics, but it is still running on fuel. It is still running on an uh, internal combustion engine, whether it is diesel-based or petroleum-based, right? It's, it's the same. So it is high time for us to, uh, you know, um, change this, this thing that we have been relying on so frequently every day. You know, there are millions and millions of cars on the roads emitting carbon dioxide as well as other greenhouse gases, right? Which pollute the environment and, you know, causes all these uh, uh, adverse effects, yeah? So naturally, the, we have to tackle this issue um, by in the transportation system. So that is why there is a, a, uh, a lot of shift in focus uh, towards, um, at, towards making our transportation system better. Uh, and one of the ways to do this is to electrify uh, all our uh, vehicles, all right? Now, of course, um, there are a few main technologies that is driving the electric vehicle adoption, uh, which I listed here tonight for your understanding. Uh, a lot of us uh, are focusing on battery technologies, and uh, that is true. But other than battery, there are a lot of other things, other modules that we have to look at uh, when it comes to electrification of vehicles, right? So first is the electric motors, right? Um, Electric motors is actually the main thing that is changing our vehicles or passenger vehicles from a traditional combustion engine to an electric vehicle, not the battery, all right? Even ICE has a battery. It is actually the motor. <clears throat> traditional or current cars, we have engines, but the engine is going to be replaced by motors. So the motor is a key component of the EV drivetrain. All right, uh, and recent improvements uh, include you know, uh, uh, motors with higher power density, better efficiency, uh, smaller size, not too bulky, as well as not too heavy, okay? But of course, to power the motor, we need uh, uh, advanced battery technologies, right? We cannot rely on what we have yesterday, right? So one of the things that is driving the, the, the adoption of EV is really the battery technologies where we, are, we have seen a lot of groundbreaking breakthroughs in recent years, uh, including the materials. I'm going to talk a little bit about the materials later. Um, I think most of us know uh, actually uh, the, um, the, uh, the most, uh, the most uh, common or popular uh, material right now is actually lithium iron. Uh, but of course, in the future, in the distant future, there will be more and more materials with better, which can deliver better uh, uh, advanced ba battery uh, technologies. Um, then, of course, that is measured through energy density, charging efficiency, and most important, importantly, it must make sense in terms of costs. All right, doesn't doesn't make sense when we have the best uh, technology, but uh, doesn't it's not commercially viable? Then it it doesn't make sense already. Now, other than battery technologies, power management is also a key um, component in the EV adoption, right? So now power control, um, uh, actually, basically, it, it includes data processing and communication modules as well uh, between um, the different power. Uh, it basically is a power drive trainer. We have to 
we communication as well as data processing each of these modules is very important because they have to communicate with, with each other all right so the energy or the physical attributes that is being managed right will include the energy uh, electrical signals and very importantly thermal management as well a lot of people uh, may have um, underestimated the importance of thermal management in EV. Um, later on, I'll show you the, the basic architecture of uh, EV, right? Then you understand why thermal management is so important. Then last but not least, charging modules is very important as well. So this is, the charging module is part of the energy storage system, uh, which includes the battery as well. And, and, and these charging modules will include the different types of charging modes. Yeah, trust me, right? There are so many types of modes, methodologies, now, what are the connectors being used, whether it's AC or DC? Uh, what is a standard that uh, we have to follow? Uh, uh, each country may want to have their own standards so on and so forth. So this has to be addressed as well in order to have a mass, to drive a mass adoption of electric vehicle. All right. So now, uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, just now, so this is a very basic um, visualization of the, what we call the skateboard designer. Uh, uh, for the EV or uh, for the electric vehicle. This is very different, uh, um, so much simpler than the uh, uh, internal combustion engine cars that we have today. And most importantly here is basically the EE architecture here where we have drivetrain as well as the, and, uh, uh, this, uh, I don't know what is this, I can't really see. Then of course we have the, 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 the chassis is also very different. And um, a, bulk, a very big part of this skateboard design, as you can see here, is actually the battery pack. Now, most of the EVs known today, the battery pack is being stored or being assembled at the base of the car. Okay, the base of the car. And that is why, and you know, um, by charging and discharging these battery packs, it, it inadvertently, it will release a lot of heat. And heat is one of the um, energy uh, that will be dissipated uh, uh, from, the, from the EV, right? So thermal management is very important as well because you don't want to have an EV that is uh, being overheated. Then, of course, number one, other than the safety concerns, it will really drive down the efficiency of the car, which I'll show a bit later. Now, um, this inductive charging, I'm not very sure. It may or may not be present in all the EVs we know today. Uh. Now, inductive charging, in other words, means wireless charging. Uh. So I'm not very sure if this is uh, present in all the EV platforms or all the skateboard design platforms, but the rest of it is the common uh, modules in a skateboard design, right? As, as versus, uh, you can just Google a traditional uh, chassis, a uh, car chassis uh, versus a uh, skateboard design. You can see the difference already. Okay, now um, let's move on to, so from here, let's move on to, you know, what are the things or what is the trend or what is the development in the electrification uh, of the EV and what is driving the automa automation demands, okay? Now, so this is a very basic comparison between a uh, conventional vehicle or powered by ICE, internal combustion engine. All right, I think I have a picture of it. Let me see, huh? Okay, yeah, this, I think this is a very uh, simple diagram of an internal combustion engine. You can see here, there's a lot of gears, right? Like, wow, very, very complex, right? Now, every time I still remember when I was driving my old car, every time I go to the mechanic, right? I'm amazed by how, how do they know where to fix, you know, or where to uh, dismantle the, uh, the belts and things like that. It's so complicated. And then, uh, as you can see here, um, conventional vehicles are driven more, uh, mainly by engines, uh, which is powered by fuels, right? Then we have the hybrid electric vehicles, which is, again, the primary uh, uh, driver is the engine. Then the motor is the secondary engine only. So, but it is still powered by fuel. Uh, the battery pack is being, the, the battery is being recharged by the uh, uh, kinetic motion of the wheels that in that in turn charge the battery. Okay, now but this this is not this is just a, to me it's just a stepping stone towards the 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 end game which is the all electric or all uh, battery powered electric vehicle. Uh, before that we had the plug in hybrid. I think most of the uh, hybrid cars today are plug in as well. Now this is where there is a shift between in, in, in the driver from engine to motor. In a plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, the, the, more, the electric vehicle is the primary drivetrain, and then the engine is the secondary support. The 
something like an auxiliary. Okay, uh, it is powered by both fuel and electricity. But at the end of the day, at the end, the end game is to have a fully battery powered electric vehicle. As you can see here, there's no more uh, orange components, purely green components. Now, just for comparison, this is how a typical uh, e-powertrain looks like. So a powertrain consists of the motor as well as the, uh, chase, uh, the other uh, parts of the drivetrain. Uh, although it may look bulky here compared to the uh, conventional ICE, but the only mechanical part of this uh, uh, e-power train, right, is this the motor here. The rest of it are actually mostly electrical uh, uh, electronics or electrical components, including the inverter. Now, the top here, most of the EV here will have the top. Uh, it looks like the... the you know, the top of the ICE where we, you know, we, 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 we dip the stick to, to, to check the, the level of the, the um, lubricant, right? But this, there's no lubricant here. Uh, this is the PDM or what we call the power delivery modules where we have all the inverters, the AC-DC, uh, so the DC-DC converter, AC-DC converter, so on and so forth. All the electronic uh, components are here, okay? So this is basically the difference between um, the conventional car as well as the uh, uh, powertrain, uh, sorry, electric powertrain of an EV. Now, what is driving this? You know, uh, as just now as I mentioned, right? Why is E? Why is EV an extension of the uh, bigger ESG theme? As you can see here, this is a, a another snapshot from this report by Transport Environment. I think it's based in US. Okay, now a conventional um, engine uh, uh, powered car, actually there's a lot of losses from the fuel to um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the power output, right? The, uh, the power generation. Now a lot of these losses are actually in the form of heat uh, as well as other energy, but mostly are heat, okay? Um, <clears throat> or even vibration, right? But okay, although I don't, I don't really understand, uh, I, have, I have not studied in depth about hydrogen uh, fuel cell vehicle. So I'm going to just take this on, on face value. Um, but you can see here between a conventional vehicle and a hydrogen fuel vehicle, right? The um, power efficiency or the power conversion efficiency is not too much different. All right, so I'm going to just take this at face value, say this is around 10% or 13%, and this is only about 22%. And the, the, a lot of energy is being lost in between in the process of converting this uh, 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 fuel, in, which is hydrogen, to the power output here. Compared to a fully battery electric vehicle, or what we call B, uh, BEV, right? The, the overall efficiency is give and take 70%, which is a huge, huge difference compared to a conventional vehicle. And this should be the, the biggest driving force for, the, for us to actually you know, uh, uh, gradually shift from a conventional vehicle towards the adoption of a fully uh, battery-powered uh, vehicle. Um, just for fun, you know, um, the... The, the most the basic component or most important component of a conventional vehicle of an ICE engine is actually the piston. All right. Uh, if you remember your lessons from a high school or university, right? This is where you inject the fuel as well as the you know uh, the bahan. Uh, I don't know. I forgot how to call it in in English. But basically, you just mix the fuel and the air together to to um to to uh, cause an explosion in this chamber, then you push a piston down, and then uh with a series of uh, with a train of pistons, it will drive the engine. The engine will drive the vehicle, right? So this is how a uh, ICE engine works. But the most basic component of an electric vehicle is actually the electric motor, and this is just a snapshot of the Audi R8 electric motor, right? So it's very different, okay? And you can, as you can see here, this is enough. Uh, for to for us for 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 the real uh, adoption right uh, a shift of adoption towards electric vehicle eventually so as you can see actually this is um not something that was just invented yesterday I think this is a very natural progression uh, we have to survive in this way we have to prolong the environment as long as we can so naturally this is the best way one of the best ways to do it lah. okay. Now, um, I'm on, I would like to spend a couple of minutes to look at the motor, the electric motor, right? Uh, because I feel that there are not a lot of people that talk about 
this part of the EV. A lot of people are talking about the battery, which, which don't get me wrong, is important, but it is also important to understand uh, the uh, requirements of the traction motor. So I mean the technical word is traction because traction means you know moving on the ground, right? So the motor has to be suitable, has to be powerful enough to drive the vehicle on the road. So that's why it's called a commercial traction motor. Now, um, in it, you may not be able to map this directly to investment opportunities, especially in Malaysia, but I think it's very essential for us to know. Okay. Now, of course, on the market, there are a lot of different types of motors, right? Uh, but mostly uh, either AC, uh, alternative current uh, induction motor or permanent magnetic motors, right? But when it comes to EV or even, um, you know, the, the future uh, flying vehicles, right? Axle front motors is uh, touted to be the next most uh, uh, the most suitable uh, motor for this application. Okay, as you can see here, the way we understand this chart is very simple. We want to have a motor that is not too heavy, which means towards the left, but we want the motor to be able to have uh, to be able to deliver the most power output, and that's why we call the power density. Now, so naturally, we want to look for motors. They are actually between these two lines here. Okay. Now here, then of course, most of the uh, motors here will be the blue dot sound, which is the axle flux type of engines. Uh, now in wheel motors, uh, then you may be asking, hey, how come? How about in in wheel motors? In wheel motors are basically motors attached to the to the four uh tires, the four wheels of the car. Um. Although yes, um, in terms of weight, is very light. Uh, then of course, uh, because due to the size, uh, relative to the size, it does it does uh, can it can uh, deliver quite a good uh, amount of power. But the problem is, instead of one motor in a car, you need to have four. So there's a concern of cost, lah, right? It's not too practical. That's why most of the EV adoption, it will be still using uh, one uh, electric motor uh, in the in the powertrain. Okay, um, so. Um, of course, uh, in the standard industrial motor, which are mostly AC induction motor or ma permanent magnetic type of motors, right? Um, although the efficiency is still is very very high uh, as compared to the more advanced motors, right? But it it shines. It really um, not they are not very good in terms of power density. Meaning, it cannot deliver the kind of power. If you want to deliver that kind of power output compared to the more advanced motor, you have to you know use much bigger motors with much bigger mass. So it defeats the purpose of using it in, in the vehicle, all right? So that is why we, 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 we require more advanced uh, solutions and uh, axial flux motors is touted to be um, the next uh, uh, trend. Uh. Now, um, I can't really talk about the technology or the workings of axial flux, so to, be, to be honest, I don't really know as well, uh, but the statistics show us or the forecast show us that this is going to be the this uh, is, is touted to be the most um, uh, um, popular or high, highest in demand of motors when it comes to uh, traction motors in the future. So much so that uh, recently there are a few uh, notable acquisitions. Uh, one of them is a French startup called Wylock. They, uh, they uh, specialize in electromagnetic solutions and they have recently been bought over by Renault. Uh, Yasa, I think, is a British-based, uh, again, specialist in electric motors as well. They specialize in axle flux motors. Uh, they recently been bought over by Mercedes. So I think this is a trend. We will see more and more this kind of trend in the future. And I, if you remember from my earlier slides, electric motor is one of the main components in the EV adoption. So with better technologies, I, I do believe that you know, with more powerful EVs, right, we, we, that can uh, deliver a bigger, uh, a longer range, right, uh, it will definitely drive the adoption of, um, excuse me, of the EV in the future, okay? Now, then of course, electrification of vehicles to definitely, for sure, no doubt about it, I'm 100% sure it will cause a really huge shift in the supply chain. Um, I think it's nothing new. I think uh, this is, again, I, I take this from a, a recent uh, McKinsey report. Uh, this is based in uh, Europe, so naturally they, 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 they use Euro to, um, uh, to, to visualize, right? So in, in 2019, uh, the market size, I mean, the, 
the market size for this electron uh, automotive electronics is about 26 percent of um you know a conventional vehicle right but in 2030 in 10 years down the road right um it's right in 20 and 10 years down down the road this is going to double up to 52 percent all right and then the market size is going to balloon from 216 billion to 330 billion in europe uh, of course, the growing components in this uh, segment will be, you know, batteries, uh, 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 inverters, uh, con uh, power control units, uh, head-up displays, uh, the LEDs, the interior design, uh, sensors is very important. And we have talked a lot about these uh, subtopics in our earlier uh, automotive electronics session, right? So if you like to know more about this, uh, feel free to go back to those uh, topics uh, which we delivered, I think, I, I think it was towards the end of last year, I should be in fourth quarter. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too much on automatic electronics tonight. Um, but um, so the impact or the, the re, as a result of this, right, actually the a high EV adoption will actually push for the demand of automation machines as well, all right? Now, uh, this is just a couple of news that I gathered from Google. Um, I think uh, based on this Reuters report that actually there was a company called KUKA that supplies robots for Tesla. So let me just zoom in for you guys a bit, right? Among others, right? Um, they recently say that their order book swelled by 52% in the first half of 2021. So much so that they ran out of capacity for any additional work for one and a half years. So you can see the, the, the demand for robots as well as uh, auto, uh, automation machines, right? Um, and, and automakers and battery builders as well need to order robots 18 months in advance. Can you believe that? All right. So definitely the demand is, is, is not going to stop. It's, it's going to keep on growing. Uh, that is why it spurs a lot of investment opportunities in this space. All right. Then, um, as I mentioned, uh, EV battery, especially in EV battery uh, component, right? There is even a higher need for automation to meet the demand. And... Um, one of the reasons is because um, why automation is key for the EV battery is because of safety uh, as well as quality control, traceability as well as the uh, delivery of battery technologies in a cost-effective way. And it's very critical. And, and you know, um, automation is very important for EV because you also have the, the productivity should be much higher than a conventional car, right? And, and of course, um, one of the drawbacks or one of the, um, uh, how to say, uh, reasons why people are not really adopting EVs, not even myself, is because of the cost uh, 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 effect, right? Um, but one of the ways to reduce the, the cost of uh, producing EV is through automation. And this and that is why um, more um, the adoption of EV would really require, it needs to go hand in hand with uh, more robotics uh, uh, application in the production process, uh, as well as other automation uh, processes. Okay, um, so this automation ranges from motor, programmable logic, pneumatic uh, equipment, which is related to gas, uh, small robots that cost SCARA, so on and so forth. Um, this is a snapshot from a Bloomberg report. Uh, basically, it just highlights some of the key players around the region. Uh, the core suppliers in the different segments of the automation equipment. Uh. Um, unfortunately, we don't, we don't see any Malaysian companies here, although we have a couple of Malaysian companies that is actually involved in the supply chain, uh, which, I will show, which I'll share later towards the end of this presentation. So make sure you stay towards the end. All right, so now um, let's, from here, now you can understand why um, we structure this uh, webinar session slowly from the top right from the beginning and how we come into uh, why we come to focus on battery technologies okay um, now uh, again this is just a snapshot i got from i think visual capitalists uh, as you can see this is just a breakdown of the cost of one uh, ev battery cell huh? so this is one cell not a battery pack okay um you, as you can see here actually most of the cost actually uh, rest comes from the cathode as well as the anode 
All right, the cathode and the anode are actually the most important component in the battery, right? So cathode is where I think the electrons are being discharged and anode is where the electrons are being collected. All right, and, and that, and that uh, uh, flow uh, creates uh, electricity or creates a uh, uh, free flow of uh, energy. Now, of course, manufacturing and depreciation is the third biggest component, so on and so forth. Um, as you can see here, the most expensive component in the EV, right? Uh, sorry, I'll show this later, but uh, just trust me for now. I mean, I mean just, just accept this for now. The most component, expensive component in the EV is the battery pack. And in the battery pack, the most expensive components are the cathode and the anode materials or the structure, okay? Um, and unsurprisingly, uh, because batteries is a key component in EVs, it is also the main obstacle of a much wider um, EV adoption. All right, because batteries are so expensive, right? And which naturally drives out the, 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 the ownership, uh, cost of ownership of an EV, right? So if you want to drive more adoption, a wider adoption, the cost of battery has to come down. There is no doubt about it. And that is why the development of more advanced batteries, cheaper batteries with higher capacity, higher densities, that can extend the vehicle's autonomy uh, is crucial for a wider uh, adoption of EV. Now, if you can remember, there are different levels of vehicle autonomy, which I shared in my previous webinar from level zero to level five, right? Where level five is the 100% uh, 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 most autonomous driving. Uh. So to support that, we need to have uh, batteries that is advanced or strong or efficient enough to, to drive the uh, vehicle as well as the uh, autonomous driving uh, features, all right? Um, but fortunately, because of the development of technologies, as well as a lot, thanks to all the researchers in the world, um, all the smart people, all the smart scientists, right? Um, the cost of battery is expected to progressively reduce. Um, I think back in 20, 2009, the average cost is about $1,000, sorry, $1,000 per kilowatt hour. Sorry. All right. Compared to 2013, uh, that dropped to that's that was half to about five hundred dollars per kilowatt hour. Then in in the expect in 2025, that cost should be even lower to about two hundred dollars per kilowatt hour. Okay, and that is why that is one of the reasons why Elon Musk right he is so focused on building a you know a uh, efficient battery production line and he call it Giga Factory, right? In order to cut, cut down the production cost, don't, don't forget that manufacturing and de de depreciation actually constitute the third largest cost component here. And that is why he want to bring this down uh, by one of the ways uh, other than the technology itself is actually to have a better uh, production uh, uh, technology for the batteries. Okay, and then, and last but not least, uh, one of the key concerns from a consumer point of view when owning an EV, right, is actually uh, the range uh, of, of the infrastructure. Uh, other than how strong or how much your battery can, can tahan, can last, uh, the, other, uh, the other limiting factor or key concern is, do we have a, a, infrastructure, a, a, a infrastructure that is wide enough for us to, you know, uh, to be driving our EVs around the country. Now, um, if, you, if you search around Facebook, you come up across a lot of articles or sharings by, you know, this electric vehicle owners club, where in the, they share their experience, you know, around Klang Valley, is, there's is no problem. It's actually quite easy for you to charge your car, your, your battery. But when you go outskirts, when you go to say, Malacca or Suramban, or even all the way out to Penang, right? Then you'll be a bit, you'll be much more concerned. Uh, all right, but I believe that this is going to change uh, uh, gradually in the future uh, where, and this will definitely be one of the drivers uh, to have a much wider uh, adoption of EV. Okay, um, as I mentioned just now, uh, batteries is the biggest cost component in the, in the EV, and this is just um, a report uh, by the, one of the Philippine Transportation Board, I think, all right? So they did the comparison for us already. So this BEV is battery electric vehicle. This number here is actually the range in miles. Okay, so as you can see here, in any types of models, uh, right, battery is the biggest comp cost component here. This is in terms of euros again, uh, 
Okay, uh, but this is going to change uh, drastically in the future. So this is the report in 2015. Um, so by comparison, in 2020, 2025, and 2030, right? As you can see, so relatively, this is the same. This is the same uh, uh, timeline here, 2015. By 2020, it's going to be dropped to about half. Then in 2025 and 2030, right, it's going to drop as much as 70% from the level here. So, so this is one of the development that is very key or crucial to drive a wider EV uh, adoption. Uh, and that is in terms of the battery technologies, much more efficient, cheaper, or in what, uh, and, 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 and better, right? Uh, uh, Cantonese say peng leng zheng, right? So in order for most of the consumers to adopt EV, right? This has to happen, right? So you can actually track. So I hope that you can see where I'm pointing at that actually, if you know what, um, if you can follow the story, right? You naturally, logically, you should see that there should be a lot of investment opportunities in the battery technologies. Okay, um, this is another again, another recap from our previous webinar. Uh, I just basically showed you the different charging levels as well as the different uh, companies uh, involved, right? And But tonight, I want to focus on this part here. You know, this is the different battery technologies that we know today and what is expected in the future, All right? The current technologies, uh, I, I, I believe, uh, uh, of course, a couple of years ago, it was mostly dominated by Tesla, Panasonic, <laughs> But the, um, a lot of producers in China are also coming out with a lot of advanced technologies as well. Um, so most of the batteries today uh, is actually lithium ion based. But in the future, there could be more and more uh, different materials that will drive up the efficiency or the you know, uh, capacity, the density of the electric vehicle battery. All right. Um, so this is basically just a very uh, summarized uh, uh, visual a graphic of the different types of battery materials, which can be used in either the cathode or the anode, uh, depending on the different types of, of um, um, uh, materials used. But this should be some of the budding or emerging uh, materials that we should see in a more advanced battery. But you can see here, it's still very much lithium based. Um, you can have different uh, um, alloys or different uh, uh, materials mixed with lithium to increase the efficiency, especially what we call the energy density, right? Because the current uh, uh, density is roughly about, I think, 50, all right? 50 watt hour per kilogram or about 100 at most. So they are talking about things like 220 uh, watt hour per liter, or uh, even two times or so this is basically the reference up uh, right now you can see that a lot of uh, focus is put on you know lithium air aluminum air sodium air so what's the meaning of air air here basically refer to oxygen um, so instead of using you know um, so what is going to happen is, is um, in order to induce the elect the current flow um, they're going to use this uh, oxidization of the different materials in the cathode and the anode to drive or to increase the you know the uh, electric the, the current flow, which in turn will deliver much uh, higher power to the uh, to the system, and that is why uh, scientists and researchers around the world are looking at all these different um, uh, materials as well as technology, right? Uh, just for example, uh, um, I think if you look at this. Uh, where let me think. Ah, lithium air, right? I think lithium air is one of the most more exciting ones. Uh, theoretically, they say that they can deliver 45 times of the current lithium capacity, all right? Uh, which is very much close to the uh, um, uh, fossil fuel uh, 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 output already, okay? Uh, personally, I'm quite excited about sodium air as well. And this is a recent uh, discovery or invention by BAS uh, BSSF, which is a, a very big uh, chemical company. Um, although although um, the capacity is about 13 times, a uh, far cry from 45 times. Now, one of the reasons why I'm, I personally myself is a bit more uh, excited about this is because sodium is the fifth most abundant element in, on earth. It's so cheap, it's so easily mined. Uh, but of course, other than, the, so which means that it, sh it should be very, very uh, uh, cheap compared to the other components or other materials, right? 
but the, it comes with its other pro, its issues like the, the different uh, uh, issues with cycling or charging, something like that. I can't really uh, understand as well. But um, graphene is also something which is very exciting. Um, graphene is touted to be the next super material for a lot of application, including semiconductor. Uh. But basically, when it, as far as uh, batteries are, con uh, are concerned, graphene-based batteries, uh, they, they, they produce very much less heat, and which means that they, you can actually charge a battery much, much faster compared to the lithium or other uh, materials, okay? Uh, so this is one of the things that is, uh, I think, but I don't think it will happen very, so soon. Uh, the other materials may be used, uh, will be commercialized uh, even much sooner compared to the graphene. But of course, these are still very much on, um, you know, uh, physical components, which is being a little bit, I mean, which we need to mine, right? So I think the end in mind here is other than this, uh, one of the technology that we have to look at is actually the solid state batteries. Uh, but much, we, we can't really, I mean, as far as myself is concerned, I have not read too much um, research articles about the solid state uh, batteries or sometimes it's too, it's too academic, so I can't really understand what's going on. But I think eventually that is where the batteries are heading. Uh, solid state batteries should be the ultimate technology for the EV batteries. Okay, right. So, um, but what I've discussed earlier on or until now is still very much on the materials. Uh, as I mentioned, it, the different materials which I shared just now could be either used in a cathode or the anode uh, component of the battery, which again, consists the highest cost, right? But Elon Musk is a very smart, he's a genius. Um, and and he he wants he knows that this is gonna come eventually, but he cannot wait for that to happen. So his he he and his team of engineers and scientists are thinking of many many other ways to number one extend I mean to increase the capacity. Uh, oh, sorry, which which the end result is to extend the range of the EV and reducing the cost of the batteries. Right. So that is why. Uh, Tesla's, this is why I titled this as Tesla's battery innovations, extending range and reducing the cost per gigawatt hour. Now, other than the materials, the, uh, the Tesla team is also looking at the different cell designs that can bring on the cost, uh, the manufacturing processes, the, even the vert, uh, vehicle integration, uh, even the dimension of the battery also plays a huge role. Now, the latest uh, uh, commercial cell is what we call the 46AP. Now, why is it called 46AP? It's very simple. The diameter of the, the single battery cell is uh, 46 mm and the height of the cell is 80 mm. So you can imagine you are packing a lot of these small, small cells into the battery pack, which I showed earlier, and to be put on the base of the car. Okay, uh, I think in the most uh, late, the most recent um, battery Tesla battery day, they share a little bit uh, about how they achieve the improvement, like five times more energy uh, capacity uh, or density. 16% uh, more range and six times more power. You may be wondering, hey, this 16% range, extended range, uh, not a lot, huh? Uh, but of course, he did this, the Tesla team did this by not really re-engineering the, the structure or the materials, but by looking at other comp the other parts, I mean, the other factors of the battery production, which to me is quite ingenious. Lah. All right, uh, a very basic thing is actually this. Uh, looks so beautiful, right? Basically, this is what they call a tabless design, all right? Um, now, the conventional battery has two tabs uh, on, on the end. If, if, you, if you roll out the battery into one flat, right, there are basically two tabs. And they found out that actually these tabs is uh, where most of the energy is being wasted. So instead of having two tabs, they actually, they, they fold the tabs together and they even put more tabs, they just cut the, 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 the edges, right, to form this and they fold it together like this. So basically, this is viewing the battery from the top. And this will actually lead, uh, contributed to all these uh, different, different uh, efficiencies or improvements, right? Just a simple uh, physical uh, change in the battery, right? To me, this is something which uh, all engineers or scientists in the world should aspire to do lah, all right by not not providing or coming up with a best solution but the most cost effect effective solution all right <clears throat> excuse me then other than that uh, they've got other things like vertical integration that improve the range as well as cost per uh, kilowatt hour and even this you know the structure of the batteries now this is a conventional or the current 
uh, automotive batteries, uh, which is being used by a lot of the EV producers, including Tesla. As you can see here, they highlighted here the red, the, the red portions, right, which is what they call the excess structures. Meaning these are just empty space, which take out the space, which take out the weight, and it's basically doing nothing, right? So the Tesla team came out with this ingenious idea. So instead of wasting this space, why not we pack more batteries inside, you know, uh, by uh, really maximizing the space in the, in the battery pack. So this, this kind of simple things can also extend the range as well as uh, reduce the cost of the uh, per giga hour. Right. So these are, these are not the only um, inventions or innovations uh, surrounding the battery technologies, but I'm showing this to you just to give you a flavor. Uh, there are many ways for us to improve battery technologies, not just from materials, not just from the cathode and not uh, structures, but as well as uh, how the battery is being produced, how the cell is being designed, how the cells are being packed into a battery, assembled into a battery pack, all right, uh, the manufacturing process so on and so forth. And this is why uh, there is a lot of opportunities for automation players, all right, around the world, including a couple of players in Malaysia to take part in this um, uh, a new uh, a value chain or supply chain of the EV battery, okay? So I hope that you can slowly see <clears throat> where I'm coming at, why what we structure our webinar tonight in this manner, yeah? So we, we, uh, go, uh, I'm going to go through to the late, uh, last uh, um, uh, topic or case studies, all right? So <clears throat> we have um, actually in Spiral Thinker, uh, in collaboration with uh, Bosa Malaysia and LiveChem, we have actually talked about this topic for in a few sessions already, in a, uh, more than two or three sessions. Uh, we've touched on different in the, uh, potential investment themes in EV, including the electronics, the power semiconductor. Uh, we talked a lot about power management uh, ICs in the previous uh, web webinars, right? So tonight we focus more on the battery technologies, uh, but of course these are not the only investment themes uh, surrounding the EV adoption. Uh, even I think hopefully in the future, we should see more opportunities, especially in Malaysia, uh, when it comes to ADAS, advanced driver, link, uh, drive, driver assistance systems, uh, computing, uh, connectivity, thermal management, charging modules, so on and so forth. So hopefully, uh, but to do this, of course, we need to have smart engineers and entrepreneurs, 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 entrepreneurs to drive this in Malaysia. Uh, so hopefully that happens, uh, okay? Otherwise, we may, may not have a lot of uh, investment opportunities when it, uh, around the EVP moving forward already. Okay, so um, so for, for tonight, I'm just going to, again, you know, look at it, look at these investment themes or opportunities from the perspective of the different uh, process in the semiconductor supply or value chain. As we know, we've got the front end, the wafer side, then we've got the OSET, the electronic manufacturing system, then uh, in the other parts like the charging infrastructure, right? So I think it is no surprise, I'm, I'm sure most of you would have read uh, in the recent news that, you know, one of our local companies, uh, Linux, which recently bought over to Terra, they are in the forefront uh, you know, of um, a lot of bit advanced technologies, including EV. Uh, recently, uh, Foxconn just took a stake in uh, Dnex. I think, I'm not sure if it's five or 10%, I can't remember. And if you have read the news, if you follow the, the, the trend as well, Foxconn has also announced to the world in many, many times that they are also uh, partaking or, or you know they want to get involved in the electric vehicle value chain. So DNS, I think, is sitting on a sweet spot. Um, they are in the right position to position, I mean, to position themselves to ride in this EV growth. And this is not just a one, two year thing, which I'll show again later. Uh, to the, uh, to why we call this a profound infection point. Of course, there are other players, um, but for now, I think the only listed company is DNX. Uh, I think we have other wafer fat or front end players like Opstar, which is not uh, listed yet, and so on and so forth. On the old set, um, we have talked about uh, uh, most of these com um, uh, companies that already. Uh, I think in the offset space, the the, the most obvious winners or beneficiary of the EU adoption is, I think, uh, Malaysian Pacific Industry MPI because of the uh, venture into silicon carbide. 
Now, I hope you remember we, one of the sessions last year, we talked about the fourth generation semiconductor, uh, where silicon carbide uh, is one of the uh, materials that is touted to be the next generation of semiconductor materials, right? Now, other than that, um, I, we believe that Inari, Unisem uh, are indirect, uh, sub, should be involved in directly or indirectly in the EV supply chain eventually. Now, KESM being the uh, only uh, independent uh, burn-in service provider in Malaysia and they're focused specifically on automotive. So naturally, they should uh, be the beneficiary of a wider EV adoption as well. Uh, because of the clients that they serve, all right, which includes NXP, uh, ST Micros, and so forth. Unfortunately, on the EMS, uh, so far as far as far as our research is concerned, uh, we have not found any clear beneficiary. Uh, so, but please bear in mind this is a non-exhaustive list. Huh? So we may have missed out if we, if we have, if we have missed out, please let us know. Uh, but on the infra charging, uh, in charging infrastructure or charging module side, we have companies like Pestec and Yinsen, which also re uh, recently ventured into a renewable segments, which include charging. Um, but personally, I believe that the biggest driver or the should be the biggest player in this charging infrastructure should be the Nangala, because this is a this charging infrastructure requires regulatory standardization as well as a national policy to make this work so naturally i think the naga i personally believe that the naga national will be a key player but how much are they would they be involved especially in terms of commercial um the aspects right remains to be uh, unknown uh, because of, uh, the framework is not mature it has not been published so let's follow this space closely they may be a direct beneficiary or they may just be a policy uh, uh, um, a contributor or you know a, 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 a key stakeholder we don't know yet but i think this tanaga is a company that we should not uh, dismiss when it comes to the charging infrastructure of ev i put jhm here because i think recently i think last year end of last year they did mention you know, because of the relationship with some of the clients, they are in the position to benefit uh, in the EV adoption, although they did not specify any details. Uh, so a lot uh, is yet to be seen as well, but I just put here for the record. But other than this, of course, there are other the supporting industry, the AT equipment players, as well as automation specialists. Uh, here we have a lot more other candidates like Genetech Technology, I think it's very clear, like Greg Tech, uh, because of the clients in Lordstown. Uh, Vitrox of their, you know, their, uh, they have they supply a lot of the machines in the automotive space as well. MIT Innovation, Panamaster, Panamaster is also uh, a company, uh, ATE, that, in, that is involved in the SIC as well as other tech, auto, uh, automotive uh, production process. And last but not least is QES. QES, um, because of their uh, exposure to the different clients, especially the Nikon, uh, as well as the geographical exposure in Thailand, right? I do believe that they should benefit in the wider EV adoption. Although uh, at the moment, there are not much uh, information uh, as, uh, in, uh, from QES or some of the other ATE players, uh, except uh, Great Tech and Great, Great Tech and Genetech, right? I believe that eventually we should see more uh, development, positive development from these companies, uh, um, from the ATE as well, offset space, um, because EV is a trend that they cannot deny or cannot ignore. Because if you ignore, they, the opportunity cost will be very high, lah. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, I can we will see this list expand eventually. So maybe uh, next year or a few more months, we can revisit this topic again to see what are the uh, um, uh, developments in this space, lah. Okay, so this is just a very simple um, visualization of what or who we believe should, should be involved or benefit from the EV adoption or the EV investment team in KLSE. All right. Um, of course, other than that, uh, government plays an important role. The government has to come up with uh, policies as well as incentive that, that will actually support the, this, this, uh, the, the industry from a manufacturing uh, angle to the consumer angle, right? So I think if you read the news, if you would come, if you have read about Nasty, N-E-S-T-I, 
you should have also heard about the EV task force headed by uh, MITI, so on and so forth, right? I hope the government is serious in this because if you do not, if you're not serious and we do not start to look at this seriously, right, we are going to be left out uh, um, in this race towards the EV adoption, right? Compared to Thailand, compared to Singapore, compared to even Indonesia. I, I think you have you should have read some news before that. Tesla was considering, you know, uh, Indonesia as one of the hubs for their materials uh, because Indonesia uh, produces a lot of nickel, but that was scrapped off recently. So, I mean, they may revisit again, we never know. Uh, I personally hope that it is my personal wish that Malaysia, the government, really know what, to, what they are doing. Uh, uh, hopefully, they, they'll, they'll come up with the right policies incentives, tax breaks, things like that to support the, the, the drive the EV adoption in Malaysia. Then of course, on the consumer space, um, we are seeing more and more EVs uh, being introduced in the Malaysian market. So if you look at Paul Tan or other uh, car blocks, right, you should see that actually Volvo, uh, actually uh, they plan uh, to produce the first <laughs> fully assembled EV in Shah Alam, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, even I think I just received this news today from my team that actually, you know, um, there was that even Tesla is uh, being um, uh, slowly, it should come, you should, we may be able to see some Tesla on the road uh, uh, moving on already. In fact, this, uh, but by the way, uh, I'm not, we are not affiliated to, to, to this company. Uh, I just sharing with you what we saw on the social media. So even this uh, car dealer in uh, Salayang, right, they, they already start to market that, you know, they can, you can test drive a Tesla car from one of the uh, units in the showroom already. So probably you can check them out. Lah. Okay. Now, as a conclusion, so I'm about four minutes away from my uh, four, 9.45 mark. As a conclusion, and this is very important, the next three or four slides is absolutely crucial. I hope you can pay attention. Okay. Now, this is a um, one of the figures which I uh, adopted or I take out from this uh, uh, Barclays research about the emerging trends into 2030. And this is under the topic of industrials, manufacturing and transportation, the 21 trends. There are a lot of other topics as well, but for tonight, we're just going to focus on this topic. As you can see here, in terms of the most likelihood, and in terms of the biggest economic and technology impact or social societal impact to us, right? You can see here on this quadrant, electrical transportation, smart cities, industrial robotics, uh, battery technologies plays a very, very important role. These are the trends that is that has the most likelihood to happen and which will deliver the most impact to us. Hydrogen fuel cell, as you can see here, autonomous vehicle, they may come, all right, but in the likelihood for the next 10 years, right? They are not, at the moment, not so obvious, not so apparent yet. So we should focus actually a lot on the electrification of the uh, current transportation system. It, it will involve the vehicle uh, architecture, all right? The motor, the battery technologies, all the way to the infrastructure, uh, charging infrastructure, which I just shared tonight, okay? Including the battery technologies. <clears throat> And of course, uh, I think battery technology is under one of the key ESG and sustainability trends as well. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So why we, do we say that global EV penetration is on an infection point? Now, you have to understand this very, very simple um, economics, uh, I would say, al algebra. For demand to grow, right? Uh, it must be incentivized or the, there, there, there should be two catalysts to drive demand growth. One of them is for sure consumer. There must be an adoption by the consumer for this particular product, this particular service, or this particular technology. So in terms of EV, um, consumers are more aware about the environmental Im impact, you know, the, 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 we need to go green, all right? And then of course the cost component, so it's coming down. So this will slowly, this should eventually drive more consumer to adopt you know, the uh, EV as compared to a conventional um, um, electric vehicle. I was talking to my wife just a couple of days ago, you know, I was saying, hey, 10 years down the road, uh, do you think we should see more uh, 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 petrol station on the road or more charging station on the road now? Which got us thinking, you know, I think our next car should not be, a, uh, should 
logically I should be electric vehicle already la, because I don't want eventually the cost of filling a, a petrol car should be much higher than a, 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 a battery electric vehicle vehicle uh, 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 10 years down the road right or, or somewhere around there other than the consumption led uh, um, um, drive it must also be driven the catalyst the other catalyst is actually policies policies from the authorities call policies from government policies from the stakeholders right should be there it should be conducive it should be uh, it should be there to incentivize to drive the the demand growth if with this and this right con i'm very sure that the, the 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 technology the product will grow all right and this is what we are seeing in uh, electric in the electric vehicle space in the electric vehicle um, adoption uh, again i take this from a, Mo a recent morgan stanley research right now the EV penetration is not even 5% in the world, right? So you can see the mass opportunity, right? Driven by consumers, driven by environmental concerns, driven by more advanced technologies, driven by the regulatory, uh, 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 the more sustainable policies to, you know, or, and this is where you can see that this is where all the capital will flow. And that is why we are saying the EV theme is just going through, I mean, we are just at the very tip of the infection point here, all right? So this topic, I think, is um, going to be there, not for next year, not for the next two, three years. In fact, we believe that it's going to, go, it's going to be a multi-decade year-long uh, investment theme. Don't forget, whatever we are talking today is only this, um, sorry, uh, is only this, sorry, this field, this few aspects. There are a lot of other aspects that we haven't talked about. It does even the uh, vehicle ownership model, right? Uh, there are a lot of um, um, opportunities there as well. Okay, so that is why we believe, we truly believe that this is the we are just at the infection point of a much bigger growth uh, uh, regime, especially when it comes to EV adoption. Okay. Um, I know, I think some later on during the Q&A, some of you will be asking, hey, so what do you think about the automotive, uh, sorry, the semiconductor shortage supply situation, right? So I answer the question now first. Now, this is a, a recent uh, snapshot of a Tech Insight report. Now, although that we are seeing a lot of uh, improvement in terms of the supply uh, from the front end, the foundry, uh, the more advanced nodes, the offset, right? But in the automotive space, do we are still seeing a lot of shortages or at least tight so, uh, tight supply uh, in the in the latest few months as well, and this is because um, actually, uh, if you remember from my previous automotive electronics uh, webinar, automotive electronics uh, is actually much much more challenging, much more complex to produce. Uh, it, it requires much higher QC control as well as testing uh, to go through compared to the other uh, applications of the semiconductor like uh, consumer devices, uh, high power computing, so on and so forth. Um, I don't, we do not know how soon this will be resolved, but as far as we can see now, um, a, lot, uh, a lot of uh, these efforts are being put, uh, are being uh, executed to relieve the shortage of the automotive chips around the world. And uh, I think one of the recent news is TSMC has already secured 70% of the uh, automotive product uh, capacity, I think for the next three years or something like that, I can't remember. So hopefully we should see this um, uh, happening because as, as soon as, as, as long as this automotive chips uh, supply is, it, it should be released soon, right? Which means the ASP should come down, the average selling price should come down, which will lead to cheaper components. And then the, hopefully the EV adoption will become much faster and much wider. Okay. So with that, I hope I did not bore you to death tonight. This is very interesting, but um, not an easy topic to digest, but I hope you learned something from me tonight. So um, back to you, Shane. Thank you so much, uh, David, for sharing with us this topic. Automotive technologies at a profound inflection point. So uh, if you have any questions for David, please write your questions in the Q&A box and we will uh, address them. All right. So the first question is asked by uh, Turailingam. 
what do you think about the company PMB Tech, which is involved in silicon and uh, or lithium? Uh, yeah, PMB Tech is actually a sister company of uh, Press Metal. Um, they are not a semiconductor company, but they are more of an industrial materials uh, producer. So you are right. Uh, I, sorry, I didn't catch your name. Uh. Uh, they should benefit uh, in the current scenario because there is a lot of supply in silicon metal. Uh, in fact, I think last week they announced, uh, was it MOU? Uh? We were one of the Sabah uh, development agency to, I think, to set out a two, uh, was it one billion ringgit or two billion ringgit? I can't remember the figures. Uh, a new plant in uh, Sabah, which is which should be at least double the capacity of what they have in Samalaju, Sarawak. So they are not directly involved in the EV supply chain, but they should be a benefit uh, beneficiary of the wider. Uh, EV adoption because with wider EV adoption, the, the demand for semiconductor material would, would be much higher. Yeah. Mm, okay, I understand that. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, the next question is by Kevin Koo. Are there studies comparing battery lifespan against efficiencies in the power delivery? Uh, Kevin, this question, uh, you cannot ask me because I'm not an engineer. There are definitely a lot of studies. Um, comparing this, uh, the battery efficiencies, the lifespan, the density, right? But as an investor, you have to ask yourself, uh, um, do you want to, unless you are engineering background or you're engineering, uh, uh, you're engineering by profession or a student, all right? Um, whenever we read any research report or any of these articles, right? As an investor, we should be smart enough or practical enough to link that to investment opportunities. No point that we read so much and so deep, spend so much time. At the end of the day, we come up, yeah, we cannot link the, we cannot follow the money. Uh. So definitely there are a lot of technical um, research and articles uh, regarding that topic. Um, but I personally have not delved deep dive into this. Um, frankly speaking, it's because I don't understand enough. <laughs> yeah, but um, so what I focus on is actually the materials, the cathode and not. All right, and there are a lot of uh, 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 recent articles surrounding this topic, uh, as well as you know the 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 the, the, the five topics that I highlighted j just now from the Tesla uh, EV uh, Tesla battery innovation. I think you can start from there, and there are a lot of art, uh, resources other than reports. You can look at YouTube. All right, there is this um, channel called the Limiting Factor. You can Google the Limiting Factor. They actually quite have a quite a very quite a few videos, very interesting, very deep dive, but again, very simple to understand. But of course, other than and, and then other than this channel, there are a lot of other channels in YouTube or in other uh, social media that actually uh, talk a lot about the battery technology as well. So hopefully that uh, I point you to the direction of where you can do more studies. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, yeah, the next question is, uh, did any Malaysia listed company supply and not uh, this question is by Sim King Chai. Uh, I don't know as far as I'm, as far as I know. Uh, I don't think there is any company that supply and not in Malaysia. But you can look at the materials player. Uh, just now somebody mentioned uh PMB Tech, right? And there are other. I think there should be some other players as well. In fact, even MSC Malaysia. Malaysian Smelting Corporation should, should I think because they produce the metal sheets and so on, right? They could be involved as, as far as I don't know. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, uh, I do not know any company in Malaysia that supplies specifically the anode materials. Mm, how about battery uh, battery technologies? Battery well? technologies, again, I, just like I mentioned, um, in terms of automation, you can look at companies like Genetech as well as Gradtech. They both serve different clients. Uh, both of these uh, they, they both serve clients from US. Um, um, one of the, they are both serve clients who are major players in the EV space. So you can look at them. Uh, for OSET or even ATE, you can, uh, as far as SIC is concerned, silicon carbide, you can look at companies like MPI, you can look at companies like Penta Master. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, Raj Kumar asks, NXP, one of the customers for KSM, 
reported year-on-year revenue growth of 44% in their auto semiconductor business, while KSM is struggling to increase their revenue in their stress testing business and turning decent profits. Are you aware why the increased business at NXP is not flowing to KSM? Okay, good question, uh, Rajkumar. <laughs> to tell the truth, this is also the question that we are wondering. But <laughs> don't forget that um, KSM is not the only supplier uh, burning testing to NXP. Although in Malaysia, yes, in the Malaysia plan, I think KESM is one of the key supplier when it comes to uh, burn-in testing services to, uh, into NXP. But how much does NXP produce in Malaysia plant? You know, do they produce only the sensors or all the other components are from ADAS to, you know, to the other EV-related components? We do not know. So unless you have friends or you know people who are working in NXP, right? I can't, I can't really answer that question because I don't know. Uh, but how you can track KESM is actually through the, cap uh, the utilization. Um, as far as I can remember, KESS, KESM's utilization rate has not, re has not um, returned to their levels back in 2017, 2018, where they see a huge spike in the demand for their services. Now, I think a lot of it is because of the car, um, the auto, the automotive market in China. Now, in China, actually, the NEVs are the new energy vehicles. Uh, are, are, adoption rate is very, very high because of the incentives, as I mentioned earlier on, the policies by the government. All right, the incentives to own to to buy the electric vehicle. Uh, to produce it as well, they've got a lot of uh, these uh, tax um 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 uh, uh, break, uh sorry tax incentives, uh, but because of the lockdown, uh, unfortunately, uh, I think a lot of progress, a lot of development, a lot of these uh business um transactions is being affected lah. So this is what we have come out so far. Um, we don't know how this will be resolved or how soon. But we are tracking, number one, the utilization rate of uh, uh, KESS capacity right now, as well as the capex. Now, one of the silver lining that we can see is, I think, based on the latest quarterly result, we, can, we, we saw actually an increase in the investment capex, the, um, the investment outflow of the uh, cash outflow in, in, in their report. So we do not know what it did for again. It could be for the new plant in Malacca. So hopefully we can get more information soon uh, in the next quarter result or when we, can, when we are able to um, connect to the management. Unfortunately, their management is quite low key. They are, like, they are very low profile. So they are not very open to meet up with investors like us. So unfortunately, I hope that in the next webinar, I can provide more um, updates on KES. And definitely this one of the, uh, suppliers which we believe should benefit in the wider EV, uh, EV adoption. Mm, okay, thank you so much for sharing your yeah. two cents worth of idea. Um, Jia Hong will like to ask, what is your view on MPI recent huge investment in KPEX? Mm. Sorry, uh, Jia Hong, I, I haven't read the latest. Uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to, but MPI's business historically requires a lot of huge investment. One. I think every year they need at least 1 billion in capex just to sustain the business as well as to grow. As far as I know from my latest um, uh, brief, uh, from their latest briefing, they spend a lot in their investment in China because they're working with one of the Chinese uh, agencies to develop SIC silicon carbide in China. Uh, and they're very smart, you see, they have to take care of their friends, of their clients in, in the East. They also have to take care of their clients in the West. So in the West, in US, they are going to set up a new plant, uh, uh, totally uh, uh, SIC related plant in US, I think should be in, I can't remember whether it was in Texas or Phoenix. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember, but it's definitely in the US soil where they want to tackle the clients in US. Uh, so they can segregate their business uh, uh, clearly between uh, US and non-US clients, uh, okay? Uh, for the sake of uh, uh, client um, 
how to say, uh, privacy or security. Lah. Yeah. So I, I think that is where a lot of the investment will go to. Mm, okay. All right. So thank you so much, uh, David, for doing this oh, okay. session. Wait. Yeah, Automotive technologies at the profile inflection point. So I guess that a lot of us here have understood better about battery technologies. And yeah, where are the... remember this slide. This is a very, very important slide and this should give you so, uh, to, to prevent you from being too short-sighted when it comes to the EV investment team. Okay, thank you, Shane. And thank All you, right. Thank you to Busai as well. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, David. So let me tell you more about our next webinar and also Busai Academy. Uh, so Busai Academy is a comprehensive one-stop e-learning platform that aims to provide you with a continuous and holistic learning journey. On Busai Academy, there are a lot of investing resources that you can find, be it articles, uh, videos, recordings, quizzes, and all the courses. So we can do. So just head over to www.bursaacademy.bursaacademy.com. And yes, our next webinar is happening uh, on next Monday. That's titled Zhu He Yu Feng Xian Guan Li. So as the title suggests, it's going to be in uh, Chinese. So uh, happening on 11 April. So I just given you the link to register. So yes, go ahead and register yourself. If you are keen to learn how to do portfolio and risk management effectively all right so in the next webinar we'll address that so uh ladies and gentlemen you just heard from the founder of spiral thinker group uh, which is uh, david paul who shared with us about automotive technologies uh, at a profound inflection point so thank you so much david and may thank all of you here have a pleasant rest of the day so see you in our next webinar bye, bye everybody good night bye bye